Hi everyone, welcome back to another Wine Spectator two bottle tasting series. This one I'm super excited about. We're going back to my hometown, Napa, legendary winery, Stag Sleep Wine Cellars. We're right at the 45th anniversary of the Paris uh, Judgment of Paris tasting, um, which, you know, kind of like lit the lamp for Napa to be seen all over the world. Um, I'm Keith Goldston, Corporate Master Sommelier for Landry's and joining me, um, very lucky, very fortunate. I've got Julie Dalton, the head sommelier, lead sommelier, wine director, mama bear of Masters at the Post Oak in Houston. Yeah. Julie, great to see you. How are things? Great to see you. So Julie, um, you know, when we talk about Napa and Cabernet, I mean, it's almost synonymous, but it wasn't always like that. How, how did we end up with Cabernet in, in Napa Valley? I, that's a great question. I mean, wasn't it mostly Italian varieties and a lot of Zinfandel and, and just before this, I mean, in or, during prohibition, I mean, a lot of Alicante Bouchette was, was planted for, for church wine and Petite Syrah, I know those grapes specifically in the Stag's Leap district, but, um, uh, but this is, this is super exciting for me because the very first time I went to Napa Valley, it was to the Stag's Leap District. And, and it was just around that time that George Tabor's book had been released. It was in 06 when I was there and his book was published in 05. And I just remember reading the book and just being absolutely smitten and just read it two or three times in a row. And just it that reading that book and visiting Stag's Leap definitely is one of the things that propelled my career forward in wine. And, and I'll forever be grateful for that for that time. So, but that's completely not what you asked. And I, I, I mean, <laughs> uh, who did bring Cabernet to, to Napa Valley? I don't even know the answer to that. Well, I, there were a few little pockets, but I mean, the one that is definitely pertinent to us today is Nathan Fay. And right. The fact that he had planted six acres of, Cap I believe the very first Cabernet Sauvignon planted in Stag's Leap. So oh. to me, it's kind of fascinating that you know, you distinctly have like Nathan Fay, and then you had like George Saber, who you mentioned, who actually wrote the article for Time that covered the tasting. And it's just amazing how these little dots of certain individuals kind <clears> of <throat> connect the whole story and completely dramatically change the world of wine. Um, so I remember growing up there and it's pretty dramatic, especially with the way the valley funnels down into the San Pablo Bay at the southern end. And it's always interesting because down at that southern end near Carneros, it is always the coldest spot of the valley. Every day, any time of the day, it is always the coldest spot. And then the further north you go, all the way up to like Calistoga, it just gets warmer and warmer as you get that, you know, 25 mile drive. Right. And to me, it's amazing just what a dramatic difference sometimes 30, 40 degrees can easily happen in that 25 minute drive. Wow. Um, so I guess it makes perfect sense that grapes planted along that valley, that weather's going to dramatically impact it. So where is Stag's Leap? Where is that fit kind of in the, you know, the map of Napa Valley? Because I know you love maps. In between the, is it the Yountville Crossroad? That's the northern border of Stag's Leap. Is that right? Yeah. And then yeah. the southern part is, um, I forget what the southern border is, but I know along the west, it's the Napa River. Um, but really what makes it so unique is is the, this word I learned, orography, this, uh, this study of, of mountains and hillsides, how it just funnels in that cold air. And, and it just makes a very predictable, you know, happy hour cooling breeze is what is what I call it. Like between three and five, it's you know what time it is by when those cool breezes come. And the orography, the the specific uh, way that the mountains and and hillsides uh, play together, it just sort of keeps that cold air right and right there for for a while and helps helps those grapes really retain some brisk acidity. Um, is that how you would, and what is the, what is the Southern border? Uh, well, I mean, it kind of runs into the Oak Knoll AVA oh, and okay. it's just kind of running south. down and, you know, yeah, it absolutely. Like you actually kind of come off cutting swarf. I, anyways, we're getting into like the super geeky part of that, but it doesn't matter, but it is that Southern, you know, Southeast part of 
Napa Valley, you know, the, the main mountain range is the Vaca range where if you jump over Vacaville's on the other side, but right. what's kind of interesting is those Vaca mountains kind of run north to south, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. And there's a little kind of stag's leap outcropping that kind of shoots west mm -hmm. and it creates this, this little perfect kind of bowl amphitheater where I think the winds get caught um, and it definitely cools it off and it's dramatically cooler than just going past Oak Oak, you know, Yonkville Crossroad heading up into Oakville or Rutherford, Calistoga. And I would say on average, it's easily 10 to 15 degrees. It cooler. feels like that, if, you know, cooler at the end of the day. Yeah. So, you know, I could see where planting Cabernet there might have seemed risky because, you know, the logic was Cabernet needs warmth. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as it's played out, I think it works out really well. So stylistically, do you want to talk a little bit about the AVAs? Like when I bring like an Oakville cab, what do you expect from Oakville and how is Stag's Leap different? Well, for me, Oakville, you focus on the valley floor and uh, and it's there's just power, just mammoth power and richness and uh but with stag's leap there's this there's this velvety texture there's this um it's it has the power but there's that that little scintillating piece of acidity that that comes through that makes it not so so much of like a dead weight on the palate not that oakville is dead weight on the palate i mean no disrespect but um but there's just that like punchiness that I get in, in stag sleep fruit profi profile. Does that make sense? Is that something you get? Uh, well, and it's funny you say that because someone once said like it's velvet with an iron fist and there's just an elegance to the wines or, you know, if, you know, I hate to do the analogy comparing it to Bordeaux because they're completely different wines, but if right. I had to pick a part of Bordeaux that it reminds me of, I would say it reminds me of Margot where the wines tend to be just be a little bit more pretty, a little bit more aromatic. There's a silkiness that isn't quite as inherent in say Oakville or Rutherford. And the wines are just seductive. Yeah. You know, there's something about Stag's Leap that is always just, you know, leaves you wanting another bottle, mm -hmm. actually, not just another glass, but another bottle. Um, so being that we have one of the most historic wineries in Napa Valley, I think it's probably a, a wise thing to bring in our guest because you know he can probably tell the story better than you and I. Um, so we would love to bring in uh, Marcus Notora, who is the winemaker at Stagsley Wine Cycles. Hi, Marcus. Marcus. Hey, great to be with you. So what's what's the big deal about this winery, and why is it spelled two different ways? What's going on? <laughs> That's so confusing. Well, listen, this place, we have a, uh, a long history, a glorious history. You know, we were founded in 1970 uh, by uh, Warren Vernarski. And, you know, Mr. Vernarski, he was a uh, actually a college professor at the University of Chicago in the 60s and uh, had fallen in love with wine while on a sabbatical over in Italy and moved his family out to the Napa Valley. And as you were mentioning, you know, Napa Valley in the 60s and the early 70s, you know, certainly looked and felt a lot different than, uh, than certainly it does today. It was really kind of still re-emerging from that great American idea called prohibition, but was, you know, a real exciting time. Things were happening here. Um, so Mr. Wernarski, he was looking, he worked at a couple places, but really was looking for land. He was looking for, uh, for a place to start a winery. And he paid a visit in 1969 uh, to Nathan Fay. He visited him at his house and Mr. Fay you know, he was the first person to plant Cabernet Sauvignon here in the Stag's Leap District, or what is now the Stag's Leap District. He planted that vineyard in 61. You know, there was no Cabernet planted south of Rutherford at that time, and our region was thought to be too cold for Cabernet. Uh, but Mr. Fay, you know, he planted the vineyard. He sold his grapes to a few folks and made a little bit of homemade wine. And uh, it was, so Warren went to pay a visit to him at his house. And as Warren says it, it was as soon as Mr. Fay like popped open that bottle and the aromas started to fill up the room that that's where he had like this aha moment. Like this is the character, you know, this is the style that I've been looking for in Napa Valley. Um, and then there so happened to have been uh, 40 acres of land for sale directly next, directly to the south of the Fay property. And it was mostly a a prune orchard, you know, which of course were more valuable than wine grapes uh, at the time, uh, along with some other varieties. And 
you know, Mr. Winarski. Oh, the good old days. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, he was able to secure that property, though, and uh, he planted Cabernet Sauvignon there and uh, named the vineyard Stag's Leap Vineyard, um, the winery Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. And, of course, the name comes from those rocky outcroppings that are, you know, you, you really eloquently describe our, uh, our area. You know, we are in a bowl uh, sitting on the east side of the valley surrounded by these rocky outcroppings. And uh, there's a legend, in fact, that there's a large rock, rocky outcropping right above our winery that has this big V cut in the rock. And uh, back when the uh, Native Americans were living and hunting in our valley, they used to chase the deer uh, up into these rocks in order to catch them. And there's a legend that a particularly large stag made it to one side of this V cut and then left this incredible distance to the other side in order to escape. So traditionally then, um, our area was known as Stag's Leap. Um, those rocky outcroppings are called the Stag's Leap Palisades. And then, of course, you know, we are Stag's Leap wine cellars with the uh, historic Stag's Leap vineyard. Oh, so that solves the mystery. That's like what the SLV stands for, right? That's right. That's right. And, of course, there are, as you said, there are two. So there was a second winery that also was producing some fruit wines. And uh, that also tried to grab this name of Stag's Leap, uh, which, of course, resulted in about a 10-year and uh, kind of million-dollar confusion <laughs> where the solution was we are Stag's Leap wine cellars with the apostrophe before the S, and the other is Stag's Leap winery with the apostrophe after the S. But very different foundings. Uh, they were you know, really founded and on producing uh, Petit Syrah, uh, where we really have been based on Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah, it's to me, it's crazy. I, I met one person who's was from Japan and they actually taught it as international law. And like that was part of his studies to get, you know, the Japanese bar was being able to go through the legalities of the apostrophe. So I've always just thought that that's amazing that people are even learning about it in Japan. Um, but anyways, enough about Petit Sarah. We got Cabernet, which is amazing. Um, would you recommend, should we try the SLV first or should we try the Artemis first? Well, I, we can talk about the Artemis. I think would probably be the, the, maybe the first wine to talk about in taste. And certainly, you know, the style for our wines for me really comes from our vineyards and you really described well, I think uh, the style of Stag's Leap Cabernet, um, called, you know, that velvety texture, I call it soft power. You know, our region here, um, we do have that cooling period you know, with the winds that funnel up exactly 3.30 in the afternoon. Uh, the fog here lingers a little bit longer. Um, but during the early afternoon, when the sun does pop out, it becomes quite warm here. Um, in fact, we're have seeing bloom right now. And here, the first vineyards for bloom, uh, which is a good marker in viticulture, is actually right out here and then up in some warmer vineyards up in uh, St. Helena. So it's that combination, I think, of the, both the warmth and the, and the cool nights that gives us this kind of soft power. The wines are very complex. Um, they have a lot going on, but they don't tend to be too over the top or too heavy. And that's a style that I wanna see in both our estate wines, which we'll taste, and also our Napa Valley wines. So we produce a Chardonnay called Caria, Sauvignon Blanc uh, called Aveda, and then the Artemis Cabernet Sauvignon. We've been producing a uh, Napa Valley Cabernet, you know, for years and years. Um, in 2001 though, is when we gave it the name Artemis. Uh, Artemis uh, is the goddess of the hunt. She's the protector of the stag, and then certainly fits with what we're trying to do uh, with this wine. Uh, Artemis is meant to be a hunt around Napa Valley. You know, Napa is a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderfully diverse place um, for Cabernet Sauvignon, depending on where it's grown, whether you're up in the northern part of the valley, where it's a little, where it's warmer, let's say, or you're in the cooler, the southern parts of the valley, um, or you're up in the hillsides, or you're here in Stag's Leap, you know, the, 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 you have wonderful quality in these different areas, but the wines take on a different character and a different personality depending on where they're grown. And so that with Artemis is something that we're really trying, that I'm really trying to capture. I'm trying to produce the finest Cabernet Sauvignon that is really representative uh, of the valley. So. Um, for sure, uh, we'll use, we use fruit from uh, Fay and uh, SLV here in Stag's Leap that has that soft power characteristic. Uh, but we own a vineyard and we source grapes. 
from the northern part of the valley up in Calistoga and St. Helena, where you get a little bit more dark fruit in those grapes and a little bit of that silky, rich tannin. Um, we'll look to the southern part of the valley, uh, the Coombsville Appalachian, uh, the Wooden Valley, and Cabernet Grown in the cooler parts of Napa Valley. They take on a little bit more of a red fruit, like red currant, uh, Bing cherry, and a little bit more of like a tea leaf type aromas and really nice, uh, bright acidity. Um, and then we also look at mountain areas. Well, mountain areas are very different than, let's say, areas in the valley floor. Uh, and particularly, uh, we source grapes from up on Atlas Peak. So Atlas Peak is about at 1,500 foot elevation up above Stag's Leap. So it's a bit above the fog. And so, but there's, because you're above the fog, you wind up with more, more sunlight. So Appalachians like that, soils are very volcanic and Cabernets grown there have a little bit more of a wild personality to them, kind of more sage and huckleberry, uh, more bigger and more broader tannins. So those are really the different areas and the different characters that I want you to, you should be able to smell and taste uh, when you're tasting Artemis. Um, but again, it's also gonna be, ha, take on characteristics of the vintage. You know, we're take, tasting 2018. Uh, 2018 was a wonderful vintage in Napa Valley. And it really had, for me, kind of like two parts to it. Uh, one, it was just a classic Napa Valley summer. It was fairly cool. The fog was rolling. That big air conditioner coming off of San Pablo Bay was going all summer long. You know, my measurement for that, you know, I live in Napa and, and at home, you know, we'd love to barbecue at night. And my wife, the kids, the dog, you know, like hanging out outside. And during the summer of 2018, it was me and it was my dog because it was too cold for everybody else. Everybody else <laughs> okay. was, running, was running inside. So it was a wonderful going into yep. harvest. Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay harvest was beautiful, smooth, cool. But then we're like, okay, but we got to have all this Cabernet Sauvignon out here. What we need now is a long growing season to get Cabernet to the right brightness levels that we wanted. And that is exactly what we got. September, October, even up through the first two weeks of November, it was just picture perfect ripening weather, you know, highs in the 80s, lows in the 50s. And we got this really extended uh, growing season. And so for Cabernet, I think you find both the 2018 wines and what you should find when you're tasting Artemis, they're wonderfully aromatic. They have beautiful bouquet, wonderfully complex. But then with that long growing season, the tannins, so the structure of the Cabernets, they have a beautiful long finish, supple ripe tannin. Um, these aren't like uh, rigid wines at all. They're soft and they're really, really, I guess lush would probably be the best descriptor I could give you for the, for the tannin profiles of that. And Artemis is primarily Cabernet Sauvignon. I uh, may blend in a little bit of Petit Verdot, a little bit of Malbec, uh, but this is primarily Cab Sauv. Marcus, since yeah, you've been, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Marcus, since you've been the winemaker um, at Stag's Leap, so going on, um, what, eight years now, um, have you, has there been a change in the style of Artemis in the past few years? Well, I mean, listen, every winemaker, we all have our own ideas. We've been, my real mission with Artemis, I really am focused on on quality um, in terms of grape sourcing with Artemis. You know, we've been made an effort to uh, own uh, our, more of our own vineyards to really and work together with some of our longtime family growers. We have some growers uh, here that we've been working with since like the 70s. And those are the relationships. You know, it all starts out in the vineyard and having those strong relationships with our growers uh, and our own vineyards that, we're, that we own as well. That's where it really starts. You know, Cabernet Sauvignon in terms of the winery here. Listen, I'm always looking to increase, do things that can increase wine quality. I want to bring out the texture of the place, you know, maintain the style. And again, that style with Artemis, I think should follow along with the style of our Stag's Leap estates. Meaning I want to produce wines that are wonderfully complex. You know, that means I, I think, you know, I like wines that are interesting. You know, every time you stick your nose in the glass, there's something else that's going on that kind of draws you back in. And when you taste our wines, whether it's SLV or Fay or Caria or Artemis, you know, the, te the texture is so important. I want the wines to be perfectly balanced so that when you taste them, they're not over the top, they're not heavy, that they leave a lingering aftertaste that draws you back in to try to taste those wines again. So for sure, you know, um, uh, I, you know, I'm constantly looking at ways to improve quality, whether it's out in the field or whether it's our barrel selection that we're using, uh, how we ferment. You know, Stagsy Wine Cellars, when we were founded in 1970, was an innovative place. 
uh, you know, with the intention to bring out the terroir, right? To bring out the characteristics of Stag's Leap. And uh, that's my same intention to do with the wines today. I'm out in these vineyards every single week. And, and uh, you know, I ride this place on an ATV and work together with our vineyard manager, Kurt Grace, and on all the little details and the distinct things that in terms of the farming that we do here. Um, obviously, with our grapes for Artemis, you know, we're, we're sourcing from some different some different areas. But listen, I'm a pretty simple winemaker, right? Um, be out in the field, work with your growers to produce the best quality that we can for the vintage. That means you don't do the same thing every year. You react to Mother Nature, pick the grapes based on taste. Uh, we do some analysis, of course, just monitor where things are going. But but I pick every year can be a little different. I'm out in the field tasting, trying to find just that right moment when the Cabernet Sauvignon is ripe, but not overripe. And then in terms of how we ferment, whether it's Fay and SLV or it's grapes that we're using for Artemis, it's pretty hands-on approach. My assistant winemakers and I, I mean, we, we taste the fermenters every day, every morning. We're here early at 5.30 in the morning to decide you know, how much we, what we want to do how much we want to extract, what kinds of yeast we want to use, when the wines need to become come off the skins. Those are decisions that we base really based on taste and what we're seeing uh, both in the field. We use what we've seen in the field to help make those decisions, particularly in the first couple of days of fermentation. And then uh, and then we switch over to what we're actually tasting in the glass. You know, again, every vintage is different. Listen, we've had uh, in the years I've been here, we've had you know, powerful vintages like 2013, 2017. And then we've had elegant vintages, 2018, 2016. And you have to adjust, you know, you can't ferment the same way every year. I'm trying to produce the best quality that I can uh, for the vintage. And then when it goes to the last step, the barrels, you know, again, I was trained very simply that you taste your wine and based on the taste of the wine is where you make your barrel selections to make that wine better. And so uh, the best example of that would be with our two estate wines, with SLV and Fay. Those two vineyards have a different personality, same qualities in terms of texture, but they have different flavors. And so I use a different barrel mix than with SLV than I would with Fay because I want to express those different characteristics. All right. Well, that totally, I'm super excited to get to the SLV, um, but just, I want to just say on the Artemis, um, great job. And I would feel so comfortable like using this in a blind tasting because to me it is textbook what Napa Cab has been mm -hmm. and a great example of it. I love that it's dark fruits. Um, like if anyone's ever like, what does dark currants taste like? It's like, you should try this. Um, and then it's got that, you know, silky tannins. Um, the fruit is ripe, but not overripe. You know, you walk that line of ripe enough without getting to the jammy part, which is great. And then there's that bitterness in a good way, an herbal in a good mm -hmm. way. Like it reminds me a little bit of Dr. Pepper. And that is here in Texas, that is like as huge a compliment <laughs> yeah. as you could possibly get. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Julie, do you want to add any tasting notes or do you want to just move on to the SLV? Uh, I mean, I couldn't agree more with uh, what you were saying about it being just a picture perfect textbook example of Napa Cab. And I mean, Marcus, we sell a lot of this wine. <laughs> and I remember when Artemis was kind of like the best kept secret. Like it, it wasn't, I don't feel like it was that popular or it just wasn't that well known. Now, I mean, people order it by name without even looking at the wine list and um, and you guys have done a really great job of building that loyal following. So, um, so thank you. It's, you know, when I, it makes my life easier some nights <laughs> and, um, and yeah, let's move on to OPS. I, um, I sold, uh, 2015 Fay last night and it was glorious. It was so good. It was, I mean, it's still very young, but just in that beautiful spot of, I'm delicious, but just wait and see what I can be a little bit later. And yeah, it was a big hit. So just wanted well, to share that with you. Well, thank you. I appreciate hearing that. I mean, obviously we make wine for people to enjoy and there's no better, bigger compliment for a winemaker than to know that your guests are enjoying the wines that we're trying to produce. Um, well, and, and I guess really quick, cause now we're gonna kind of zero in on the terroir, the, the, the whole part. And, it's been interesting kind of the geographical 
references and names, the GIs, the AVAs, and basically watching the kind of new world catch up to the European mindset of a sense of place. And there are so many areas like, oh, we've got our list of you know subregions. And you're like, what does that mean to me as a consumer? Um, but I've been fascinated to watch it in Napa. And because we kind of have that same lens of Cabernet Sauvignon, I'm starting to get to where you do taste the subregions of Napa. Like how Mountain definitely tastes like how Mountain. Stag's Leap tastes like Stag's Leap. And to me, it's kind of like I'm excited and proud because I feel like we are actually like growing up. You know, it's like you can almost talk about, you know, like in Burgundy, Chambon Mousini tastes completely different than Gevray Champertin, even though they're very close to each other. And you could argue that Stag's Leap tastes completely different than Oakville. And it's about the same amount of distance. So uh, it just it makes me proud that um, these AVAs are starting to really mean a lot. And, you know, I know some of them might have been, you know, in some places more of a political just draw a line on a map. But at least in Napa, it is absolutely reflective of what you're going to get into the bottle. So this is, um, you know, a treat and it makes me happy. So going into the estate wines, you basically have got the vineyard to work with. I think you said it's about 40 acres for SLV. Yeah, they have about 34 acres, uh, 34 acres planted, primarily Cabernet Sauvignon, just a little bit of Cabernet Franc in there. Wow. And then correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was the very first commercial release from the winery is the one that actually ended up winning the Judgment of Paris. I mean, that's yeah, I that mean, is, uh, the, um, you know, SLV is a obviously has a special place for us here today, but obviously has a huge part of the history of, of Napa Valley. You know, um, the vineyard was first planted then in 70. There was a small bottling uh, produced in 1972, uh, but it was the 73 SLV Cabernet, which I've got a unfortunately oh. empty bottle of uh, <laughs> to show you. But this is the wine that made, that, that made history. And yeah, again, maybe the, the, the quick story behind that, you know, there was a British wine merchant uh, named Stephen Spurrier uh, who had a uh, yeah. wine shop in Paris. Rest of soul. Rest of soul, yes. exactly. Rest of soul. Yeah. And um, yeah. you know, he recognized that there were some Americans and Brits that were uh, visiting his wine shop. Uh, Mr. Spurrier and his partner had tasted and seen what was happening in Napa Valley, and it was exciting. It was an exciting time, um, and thought that they could sell these wines to these folks that were visiting his wine shop. But, of course, Napa you know, wasn't known <laughs> at that time. Uh, really, the place for quality was going to be Burgundy and Bordeaux. And so he invited uh, a group of French judges in for a tasting of these new wines. And uh, when they arrived, asked if it was okay to do the tasting blind and to also have some of the finest wines from Burgundy and Bordeaux. Uh, of course, they agreed. Um, and again, the tasting was blind. Nobody knew what was what. And when they tasted the Burgundies and scored them, it was the uh, Chateau Montalena. 73 Chardonnay uh, that had won in the Burgundy category, of course, at the Montalena being up in Calistoga. And then it was the 1973 Stagsy Wine Cellars SLV Cabernet Sauvignon that had won in the uh, Bordeaux category. So, um, you know, Mr. Spur had invited a lot of media to uh, cover this <laughs> and uh, none of them showed. And so at the last minute, he wound up making a phone call over to Time Magazine who sent a man named George Tabor uh, over to document this event, along with his wife, who was turned out to be the photographer for the event, the only source of, of photos for this. And Mr. Tabor wrote this little article uh, called The Judgment of Paris that appeared, I've got the original Time magazine that this appeared on, and it appeared on, this is like page 56, right? Across from like a tire commercial. <laughs> and it was that little wow. article that documenting this tremendous victory uh, by this by this these American wineries, these Napa Valley wineries over what the French were most known for that got picked up by news organizations around the world. It was kind of that, I guess, that going viral of the uh, of the mid 70s. Uh, but for folks that were living here in Napa Valley, I mean, what an inspirational moment. That was that glass ceiling moment. That was the really the vindication that, yes, we felt like we could produce world-class wines and yes, we can produce world-class Chardonnay. We can produce world-class Cabernet Sauvignon 
and really gave some direction um, to the Napa Valley. So SLV has got a, a special place. It's a special vineyard. And yeah, those were pretty young grapes. But one kind of secret for winemakers is that sometimes young, young vines can produce pretty exciting wines sometimes. And that's a great, uh, great example of that. So Marcus, you have yeah, a lot of pressure. You have a lot of pressure with that reputation going, right? I mean, this was the wine that this was the red wine that put Napa Valley on the map and made it relevant, if you will, to the rest of the world. And do you feel that, I mean, what percentage of people that come into the winery already know this story when they're visiting Napa Valley and they're just like, wow, this is, this is the place that put Napa Valley on the map. I mean, how many, uh, do you feel a sense of pressure in your day to day to keep up with that reputation? Well, listen, I'm, I'm humbled to be able to uh, make the wines here uh, today. It's a, you know, not just for the history, but it's such a special place um, in the vineyards. I mean, Faye and SLV, as I said, I mean, I like coming out here on the weekends and walking around. There's just a magic um, in our viticulture area and they produce such wonderful and age-worthy wines. Um, you know, back in normal times when we're out traveling around and uh, I love hearing stories from our guests of folks that have purchased our wines with the intent of aging them and bringing them out for a special anniversary for their kid's 21st birthday. And to me, that is inspirational um, to know that people are collecting our wines to be to enjoy on those special occasions. And also it inspires me to do my very best to bring out the characteristics of the wine, bring out the characteristics of the, vine of, of the vineyards themselves. Uh, and produce um, age-worthy wines that are going to provide pleasure for them when they open them. But people do, uh, the Paris tasting, I mean, it, uh, you know, we're celebrating the 45th anniversary this year. And last year was the 50th anniversary of the winery. And you'd be amazed the amount of folks that recognize that event. Maybe the best example I remember of, it was during harvest a few years ago, and I was kind of wandering around the cellars, you know, it's harvest. So I got my T-shirt on, growing my beard out. And uh, there were some guests that were lost um, and uh, they were, I went over to them and I'm like, Hey, you know, can I help you guys out? And they're like, well, we're looking for the tasting room. And I'm like, Oh, well, you know, we just built this new tasting room here. I'll show you where it is. We just go right over here past the cave and it's in there. And they're like, Oh, thank you. And, uh, and congratulations. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, congratulations for what people get lost here all the time. And they're like, no, you know, you guys won the Paris tasting. Back in 1976, congratulations. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, <laughs> wow, that's, thank you. <laughs> well, that's cool. The, the tip, yeah, and that's super cool. And the, but I also think what has been kind of fascinating is there have been multiple redos of the tasting and Stagsley continues to come out on top, you know, and that to me is, you know, I, I love the French kind of complaining at first, like, oh, our wines were too young. And I was like, all right, we'll give you a chance to age and Napa still wins. So, you know, I, I think they have definitely deserved it at the time. You know, I, I think about like the greatest like first impression and for this to be the first commercial release, to me, it reminds me of being a big San Francisco Giants fan. Uh, Will Clark's first debut, like his first major league at bat was at the Astrodome against Nolan Ryan, and he hits a home run. And it's like, you can't really start your baseball career much <laughs> Any better. better. So, <laughs> yeah. So coming out with your very first commercial wine, winning the Judgment Paris is just phenomenal. Um, and I'm so happy that, you know, it has allowed, you know, Napa to be relevant and just continue making great wines. Uh, when I dive into this SLV, I, I want to compliment you because it's accessible now but I feel like I'm tasting maybe 10, 15% of its potential. Like it still drinks great, but there is so much life to this wine. Um, and it's just got this really cool kind of graphite yes. pencil lead thing that I normally associate with Bordeaux. I thought but the it's same kinda cool. thing. It's, I was like, it smells like young Bordeaux. You know, that is- Yeah, exactly and then like the savoriness on the mid palate. No, that's is, a great descriptor it's, it's, for the personality of SLV. I mean, I think you see it in the older wines too along with the younger wines, but that sense of graphite, and I call it a bit of a dusty cocoa powder, um, you know, yeah. violets, currants, you know, those re that, that's what makes the vineyard so special to me. Again, uh, when, when the vineyard has personality, every vintage is gonna be a little bit different, right? We have 
warmer vintages and cooler vintages and wet and dry. But if you can taste through a vertical of from a single vineyard and you can still pick out that personality in every single wine, that's what makes it a special place and a special vineyard. And uh, that is SLV's personality. And, um, you know, in terms of the texture, again, I mean, Stag's Leap District Cabernet has, again, they're rich wines, but they don't tend to be too heavy, too over the top. And I remember being taught um, many times by, uh, or told many times by uh, Piero Antinori that he's like, Marcus, wines do not need to be undrinkable in their youth in order to have potential for ageability. And I really believe that. And SLV itself, uh, it's a kind of a like lazy that. vineyard, how's, how it ages. It ages very slowly. And when I'm putting together the final blends, it's it's trying to find that right balance with fruit and tannin, whether it's a more on the more elegant side or the richer side. As wines age, the tannins soften, but so does the fruit. And so that's why it's so important to have that combination together um, right up front. And the point of aging a wine is, of course, that the wine gets better. And it's better when you open it uh, 20 years from now or 25 years from now than it is, but it doesn't need to be undrinkable in its youth in order to have that. It's just going to continue to uh, age and continue to evolve. Yeah. Marcus, the ageability of the wines is incredible. And Julie and I have been really, really lucky to open older bottles in the restaurants. And my really, my biggest complaint is they're just really hard to find. Is there like a secret stash you have at the winery is, you know, is there some kind of like, you know, Indiana Jones room where if the fog comes at the right time of day with a mirror that opens up the wall, you know, how do we find some older vintages of Stag's Leap? Well, it's not quite that complicated, uh, but we do have, <laughs> we call it the wine library. So obviously this is not full of books, but this is, of course, is full of wine where you can bring in, where you would want to bring a nice book in order to uh, and enjoy some older vintages. So, you know, of course, you know, as a winery, we do hold back wines. Um, you know, to be enjoyed later, you know, last year being our 50th anniversary, we had lots of plans, you know, this year, the 45th anniversary of Paris tasting, lots of plans and our wines do age gracefully. Um, and we have a good size library and we were planning to release a lot of these wines. Actually, one of the hardest things I had to do last year was in preparing for these anniversaries was tasting through the wine li library to be sure that everything was fit. So very difficult part of my job, tasting through the library. Uh, but we are gonna <laughs> yeah, release that, some That sounds terrible. I'm it's so terrible sorry work. for you. So sorry for your inconvenience. <laughs> yeah, it, anyway, we are releasing some wines so this year. Uh, we're calling it the Legacy Collection. We're releasing some older vintages directly uh, from the winery. Um, our wines do age extremely well. You know, ageability, I think you kind of have, there's really three key reasons. One for sure, it comes from the site and our site here in Stag's Leap with those cool nights, the fog that lingers, preserves a lot of great natural acidity that lends the grapes themselves to be made in a style, which I think is the second most important thing for ageability to make these wines in an ageable style, meaning wines that are, they have enough richness to them, but they're not over the top. When we go to bottle, they're just this perfect balance of fruit and tannin. And then the third most important thing, so you got the site, the style, and then the cellar is, I think, the third key. That's how not only how we have handled the wines here in our barrel aging and bottling and those types of things, but then, of course, how you've handled them uh, once they get out uh, to your house or to your restaurant. And so that's one of the great things uh, or one of the kind of exciting things to be releasing some older vintage because for sure the cellar has been perfect because they're aged right here and this nice. is where we're releasing them from. So keep an how, eye out. How many right, years back? Then, like how far back uh, can we buy? Uh, we're going to be releasing some wines all the way back to the 70s. So, um, Woo wow. It's a fun. Yeah. And, the, and, and then where does one. Point. Wow. And then where does one find this legacy collection? Do I need to go get Nicolas Cage out of retirement and have like American <laughs> treasure, you know, Knights Templar hunt to find the collection? <laughs> You just, no, you, it, it's it's much simpler. Just check out the website, and there's a link right up there for okay. you. The Legacy Collection. So I think I, that's where you'll see them. Marcus, is there any Cabernet Franc in this wine? Like, there's just it's pure elegant nose that I, I, I mean, there's so like a lot of tobacco and violet, and that to me is a signature Cabernet Franc uh, tell. Is there any Cabernet Franc in this wine? There's no Cabernet Franc in SLV, but we did plant some uh, Cabernet Franc. Is okay. uh, personal 
you have, for me, if you have really wonderful Cabernet Sauvignon, like perfect, right? Um, Cabernet Franc is the one variety that to me, I like to use for blending to even make it better, to add more complexity, mm -hmm. uh, to add more character. So we did in 2014, uh, plant a bit of Cabernet Franc in both SLV and in the Fay Vineyard um, with the intention uh, in the Fay Vineyard, you know, Fay has a different personality than SLV. It has more of a perfumey floral note. And my thought is like, okay, I think a little bit of Cabernet Franc might help push on that. And I have been blending Cabernet Franc into Fay for the past uh, few years. And then the, the uh, Cabernet Franc we planted in SLV, I'm thinking of Cast 23. So Cast 23, of course, is our, our, our top wine. It's our uh, really a wine about complexity and intensity. And my thought is that maybe this Cabernet Franc from SLV would add another dimension to that particular wine. Any plans to bottle a mono varietal Cabernet Franc? Just side note, I'm just uh, my own personal. It's, I'm yeah. so excited for Napa Valley Cabernet Franc right now. I can't get enough of it. I, I love the varietal. We bottle a small amount um, for, that we have available here at the wine shop, and we are uh, been planting more Cabernet Franc as well. In some of our vineyards that we're growing for uh, for Artemis. Now, I, I agree with you. I'm excited about the variety. It's challenging to grow. You know, you need to get it. We it has to. You yeah. know, it likes to have a, has a lot of variability in how it grows. It's definitely a lot more challenging. Mm -hmm. But when it's ripe, when it's perfect, it's very enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. For me, for me, it's like garlic. You know, it's it's really easy to cross the line. Like when you're cooking, it goes from <laughs> great flavors to too garlicky. Um, but I totally agree. Like when <laughs> you get a good it right, analogy. It is, it, it's absolutely a wonderful ad. Um, well, Marcus, I, I just wanted to say thank you for, you know, continuing the tradition, carrying the torch. Um, this is one of those wineries that to me makes me proud that I grew up in Napa. And, you know, the whole genesis of how we got there, I mean, it's just, it's such a fascinating thing. And it's such a great story about people working together. Because I just think about like Robert Mondavi opening the winery and his first winemaker being Warren. And then who replaced Warren? Mike Gergich. And then Warren and Mike go out and make the two wines that win the Paris tasting. You know, it's just so cool that we can trace it back to, you know, kind of like a superhero origin story. But in this case, it's like the Avengers of Napa Valley. So really cool. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, um, you know, I look forward to hopefully at the 50th anniversary, uh, you know, if you need a sommelier for like the big party that we should probably throw, I'd like to put Julie and I's names in the hat to uh, help out with that. But <laughs> great you're, wines. You're on. Continue. You're on. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Julie, did you want to add anything in closing? Um, no, I just, I just thank you for making such beautiful wines and, um, I, I don't know. Like I, I really don't have much else to say other than thank you. And these are delicious. And um, yeah, I thank you for keeping keeping the legacy alive and uh, doing great work. Well, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure uh, to be with both of you. Cheers. 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 Cheers.